I'm going to bring my fly rod. Yeah, I've been waiting to do this with this EP. How many of you fly fish? How many of you in this section right over here fly fish? So I just started fly fishing and I've been waiting with this EP. I want to catch something like right around here, right? Somebody was asking me, can you fly fish on your Sabbath? I say, yes, you can. (laughs) Absolutely, right? I have just started fly fishing in my backyard and have found that it's not too successful unless you make it all the way out to the creek. (laughs) We've been catching these little fish uh, in the creek in my backyard, which has been amazing. Um, But fly fishing is incredibly relaxing unless you don't catch anything. Unless you're fly fishing and all of your lures snag on something and you begin losing all of your lures, then fly fishing becomes irritating and vexing. And then all of a sudden you start losing more than just your Sabbath, you start losing your religion as well, (laughs) amen? How many of you have ever felt like you've completely wasted a day off? Like you've, you've had the day off and you've had nothing to do and just found yourself lounging around, maybe watching a little too much TV, maybe napping halfway through the day, waking up, feeling more groggy than when you started just to realize I feel like a wreck. I have wasted the day. This does not feel like a restful day. This has been completely wasted. Anyone feel like you've wasted a day? Yeah? We've had days off and we've wasted days off. How many would admit after we've started this series, maybe you've come to the realization, I've wasted a couple of Sabbaths. Maybe I didn't realize what Sabbath was supposed to be, what what real rest, what entering real rest was supposed to mean. This series, what does it mean to enter real rest? rest. We started off by talking about our deep need to stop. And in our stopping to remember. And in order to really enter real rest, we have to incorporate worship. It's not just having a day off. It's not just going fly fishing. It's it's not just taking a nap. It's not just having the day off and disconnecting from things. It's doing what we were created to do, entering into our relationship with God. I'm skipping to the very end and letting you know what the whole sermon is about. Real rest is worshiping God connecting with who he is, understanding who he is, adoring who he is, and worshiping who he is. When we do that, when we stop, when we remember, when we worship, it's as if we re-enter the garden, we re-enter what we were created for, a relationship with God, and we are where we were created to be in the presence of our creator. In our creator's arms, where we have the treasure of everything we were made for, resting in our savior's arms. So before we do anything, can we just stop remember and worship. I know you're saying we just sang some songs. Is is worship more than just singing? Can we worship in praying? Can we worship in reading? Can we worship in meditating, in contemplating? Can we worship in silence? Let's, let's take a minute to worship. Um, I'm going to open up to Psalm 46. You can if you want, but, but what's more important is that I want you to do what 
the psalm instructs us to do, to selah, which literally means to stop, to remember, and to worship. So three times in the psalm, the worship leader instructs the audience to stop, to remember, and to worship in contemplation over the words that were just read. So I'm going to read these words to you, and I've just put these prompts up on the screen to help you to stop, remember, and to worship over what was just read over you. So we're gonna do that real quick. So listen to the word of God. God is our refuge and he is our strength. He is a very present help in trouble. Because of that, we will not fear though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters may be roaring and foaming, though the mountains may tremble at its swelling. Stop, remember, and worship God because he is our refuge, he is our strength, he is our trouble. For the next couple of seconds, stop and remember who he is and worship him. There's a river who is God. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the most high. God, the almighty is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice and the earth melts away. The Lord of angels armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Stop, remember, and worship the God who is an overwhelming river, the God who is in our midst, the God who is with us. Over the next couple of seconds, stop and remember that this God is with us you. Take a second to just worship him. Come along with me. Behold, remember, think about all of the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations upon the earth, how he makes wars cease to the ends of the earth, how he breaks the bow and shatters the spear, how he burns the chariots with fire. Be still, stop. And know, remember that I am God. I will be exalted. I will be worshiped among the nations. I will be worshiped in the earth. The Lord of angels' armies is worshiped. The God of Jacob is in our fortress. The word of God literally says here, be still and know that I am God, I will be worshiped. It literally says, stop, remember, and rest in worship. So before we move on and unpack more of this, take a second right now and personally stop, remember, and worship him, thank him, adore him. Take a moment to personally rest in worship with God.
Father, I don't know why we don't do this more. It is so good to breathe, to feel the weight taken off of us, to to worship, to be in your presence, to feel your almightiness, to feel your strength, your power, to, to read these words and to be reminded about you, about your your power, your omnipotence. To be reminded of your greatness, but also to be reminded of your intimacy. To be reminded of this treasure that you have given us, that you've given us this day, this treasure, this this day that we get to carve out from other days and just be with you, to dig into the depths of this treasure of your goodness, to be reminded of your power and your intimacy that is available to us, this gift that you have given us, this gift that I pray we would not waste again, that we would take advantage of it, that we would feast upon it, so that we could live our days in light of this treasure that you have given us. Thank you for the Sabbath. Thank you for allowing us to rest in your worship. In your name, amen. A treasure wasted, a day off wasted. Something that that I hope we can grow into this habit more and more, carving out a Sabbath, carving out a day, allowing 24 hours to redefine our weeks. I'm hoping that this summer series can not only recalibrate our summer, but begin to recalibrate our lives. That we can begin literally setting this table and allowing it to to redefine how we engage in our weeks. I know for our family, it's starting to reset the tone. Um, Me and my wife, we've been engaging in this conversation. Um, I've been talking with with Stu. Like this is a conversation uh, that we've been engaging, me, Stu, uh, my wife, ever since we started reading uh, one of these books that I've encouraged you to read, uh, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. We've been talking about this for two years. How do we not waste this treasure that's been given to us? Like a lot of things have been given to us and and we simply waste them because we don't understand them. As we read this Psalm, Psalm 46, and this this Psalm that we're uh, about to read here, Psalm 84, we hear these authors talk about certain spiritual disciplines. Not only Sabbath, a, a day that involves solitude, a day that involves silence, a day that involves scripture reading, a day that involves going to church, prayer, meditation. Like how many of you hear words like fasting and Bible reading and prayer and and there's something in you that just kind of cringes just a little bit. Like, oh, those are things that I was forced to do growing up all my life. Anyone else like growing up Southern Baptist, like I know like we had Bible drills and like we were disciplined by slapping on of hands to to get better at these things. You know, so we, we kind of grew up with negative connotations, but When we read the word and and what we're engaging in today is we find that these spiritual disciplines and things like the Sabbath, they're not disciplines, they're actually treasures, they're gifts that have been given to us to help us engage and they're graces that have been given to us to help us encounter personally God Almighty. They're gifts to help you understand the treasure that has been given to you. Have you ever been given a treasure that that you might not have known was allocated to you? The, the, The Comstock load of 1859, does that ring a bell to anyone out there, any any historians? You've heard of the gold rush, right? Well, at the end of the gold rush, when, when the gold was kind of drying up on this end of the country and people were, were, were mining and like, like these claims were kind of running dry and they, they couldn't find gold anymore because all the gold has kind of been found. There's a limited supply of it. 
all these old prospectors were, were, were getting to the end of. And there's this one old prospector who had this claim that he just wasn't giving up on. And, and not only was the mind drying up, he was physically drying up. He was getting closer and closer to death. And he had some friends that were trying to pull him away and get him to just give up on trying to find gold. And he wouldn't do it. And eventually he literally died digging for gold. And his friends came around him and, and, and gave him this burial. He wanted to be buried in his claim. So they were digging his grave. And as they were digging and burying him, they noticed a weird texture to the clay that they were using to bury him. And one of his friends, Henry, took some of the clay and went and had it evaluated to find out that this bluish texture that was in the clay was silver. So he went back and started to find that that was kind of defining a lot of the texture around. And he was just like, I'm going to buy my buddy's claim. So he bought it and found out that there was a lot of silver in what his old prospector buddy was looking for gold. All along, his buddy was dying a homeless, destitute, poor man's life while he was sitting on a fortune of silver. And Henry Comstock uncovered one of the greatest finds of silver. So think about it. This old prospector for years was living on a treasure, living the life of a homeless man, all the while living on a fortune, living literally on a treasure. Cascade, that defines us. We are living on a treasure of rest, a treasure of peace, a treasure of provision. But we live spiritual lives of destitution, of, 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 of just homelessness, of, of being poor wrecks because we do not know the treasure, we ignore the treasure that is living underneath our feet. Because we ignore the Sabbath, we run too quickly, we are digging for gold when the treasure of silver is right underneath our feet. So how do we stop, remember, and worship what has already been given to us? The rest has been given to us, the peace has been given to us, the provision has been given to us. Listen to how the, the psalmist, how David says it here in Psalm 84. He says, blessed are those whose strength is in you. Like th that right there is a powerful statement. Blessed are those whose strength is in you. Where does that person's strength come from? Is it something they muster inside of themselves? Blessed is the person whose strength is in you. They find strength in God. This is a concept that he comes back to. Blessed is the person who finds their strength in you. It's God's strength. It's the treasure of strength found only in God, an unlimited resource of the power of God. Can you imagine tapping into, mining into the strength of God? That's a blessed person. You've just mined into the power and strength of God. That is a blessed person. And that is what the psalmist is saying. Blessed is a person who taps into the power of God. Blessed is that person. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the Valley of Baca, any geography experts, you guys know where the Valley of Baca is? Actually, you, you all do. You've heard of this valley before. It's actually referred to in Psalm 23 as the valley of the shadow of death. Now listen to what he says here. As they go through the valley of shadow of death, they make it a place of springs. Have you ever met a person that goes through the valley of shadow of death, but they make it a place of springs? They go through the worst of times, but it seems to not phase them at all. And you're just like, how in the world did you do that? How is life circumstances crashing around you, but you seem to be singing zippity doo dah through the whole thing. Like you just seem to be unfazed through everything. How are you doing that? Listen, they, he explains it. They go through the Valley of Baca. 
they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Where's their strength coming from? God. They go from God to God. They go from God's strength to the strength of God. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord of hosts, O Lord of angels' armies, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Now he just gives God a name, O God of Jacob. What does that mean? Who is God of Jacob? Who is Jacob? Is that just some random guy? Like he just said, hey, God of Carl, God of Nehemiah? Like, is he just making names up here? Or does that name have meaning? Where does that name come from? Please, someone tell me right now. Oh, someone's gotta know. Jacob is in what book of the Bible? Genesis. Does that name have a story? Does that name have a history? Is that name a biblical reference? Does that name scream of the story and provision and history of God? Yes. So when he says the God of Jacob, that is a biblical reference, a study of the word of God, a meditation of the word of God, a memorization of the word of God that he is quoting, that he is citing, that he is calling, that he is remembering. Amen? Hear my prayer, give ear, O God of, of Jacob. Selah, stop, remember, and worship that God. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed, for a day in your court, a Sabbath in your court is better than a thousand days elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper on this day in the house of my Lord than dwell in tents of wickedness. So here in this Psalm, this Psalmist mentions taking a Sabbath, singing and worshiping God reading the Bible, meditating on the Bible, memorizing scriptures. He references all of these things in a way to say, this is how I move from strength to strength. This is how I move from Sabbath, from a day of Sabbath to a life of Sabbath. This is how I move from a day of rest and worship to a life of rest and worship. This is how I wake myself up and I, I stop living my life as an old prospector who is empty and depleted and, and has nothing to respond to life with. Do you know what that's like? That's when you waste a Sabbath day and you're not worshiping, you're not tapping into the resources and you're living life in your own strength. You have nothing to respond to life for. Okay, I'm so sorry, I'm possibly gonna offend someone in here. Do we have anyone in our congregation right now named, I'm so sorry, Karen? <laughs> all right, no one in here right now, good, okay, all right. If there was, I was going to apologize because social media has just eaten you alive. Do you understand what it means to be a Karen today? Okay, do you understand that reference? Okay, my, my kids, they watch these memes all the time. It's just these, all of these collections of videos of like, watch this Karen, right? Someone in the middle of Walmart at the self-checkout line that completely loses it because something goes wrong and they have no emotional bandwidth to respond to a social situation with logic and emotional intelligence they lose it and they respond like a child. This grown woman just starts annihilating everyone in her path. You, you know what I'm talking about? Okay, they're responding to life as a Karen. In times of pressure, in, in her 
Valley of Baca, Valley of Shadow of Death, the poor thing in the checkout line of Walmart. She has nothing in her to help her respond in a healthy way. So she just responds like a terror. How many of you would admit that you've got a little bit of a Karen inside of you? Okay. If you're not admitting it, just grow up and admit it because you're lying through your teeth right now. Most of us, like when we, (laughs) there's some point during the week where you know you're responding to your kids or you're responding to your husband, you're responding to your wife and you know you've just been depleted for the week. You've run out of your emotional intelligence, your social intelligence, your good common sense and you're starting to behave just a little bit like a child. You have been depleted. You are definitely not operating from strength to strength. Listen to what God is calling us to, the life that God is calling us to. We begin our week with rest. We begin our week by stopping, by remembering who he is, by worshiping him, by digging deep into the minds, into the treasure of who he is so that we can move from strength to strength, from the depths of grace and operate out of that grace into our world, into our life, from a Sabbath day to a Sabbath life, from rest to a life of rest so that we operate out of that grace in our daily lives. That's what God is calling us to. And Jesus demonstrates this for us. He lives this out for us. And I I wish we could see like a a 24 hour period of time. I wish there was something captured in the word of God where we could see just 24 hours of, of the Sabbath day in Jesus's life. So we could see what that Sabbath meal would look like. And we could watch Jesus as he would go to the synagogue. Like we can see little snippets of it. We know that he went to festivals. We know that he kind of argued with his brothers and sisters about if he was going to go to every single one of them. And then he did end up doing that. We know that he went to synagogue on Saturday mornings and he was chosen to read some of the scriptures. We know that he did send his disciples away to prepare for the Sabbath meals. So we, we know we have little snippets, but I wish, man, I wish there was like a GoPro that could be sent back in time to get a picture, a video of Jesus worshiping. Wouldn't that be awesome? Reset that. I would love to have a video of Jesus worshiping. Like did, did he sit, there, was Jesus a right-handed worshiper or a left-handed worshiper, right? Did Jesus worship with like small fish or big fish, right? Like was Simba heavy or was Simba light? Did he change light bulbs in worship or were they too hot and he just... Just watch the worship team and you can define them in all of these terms later on, right? Like, I just wish that we could see Jesus worship, but we, we don't have that picture. But what we do have is, is in this, this scripture that, that we are fairly familiar with. And, and I wanna look through this because we can unpack some of the liturgy that Jesus was very familiar with, the Sabbath day liturgy that Jesus stayed in that was so deep in his heart that it just naturally overflowed out of his mouth. So so turn with me to Matthew chapter four. And then with your your Old Testament, that's your New Testament finger. With your Old Testament finger, I want you to be ready with uh, Deuteronomy chapter eight, okay? We're gonna be flipping back and forth, okay? So have your New Testament finger and your Old Testament finger ready to go, okay? At the beginning, right before Jesus's public ministry, the Holy Spirit led Jesus out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. That's such an interesting concept, isn't it? Matthew chapter four, verse one, then Jesus was led up by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, He was hungry and the tempter came 
and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. So the tempter came to Jesus and immediately started tempting Jesus on several fronts here. First, he's attacking Jesus's identity. That is so key. Like you'll probably hear me talk and refer to identity more than just about anything because it is so crucial to our spiritual lives. And here you see that that is one of the key things that Satan tries to do, even in attacking the son of God. He starts by attacking Jesus's identity and he does so by looking at one of the weakest places in Jesus's humanity, his hunger, his identity and his hunger. Is your God going to provide for you? So logically, Jesus was hungry. He's been going 40 days without food. Do the math with me. 40 days is more than a month, right? Because there's at least 30 days in a month. How many Sabbaths are in a month? There we go. Good job, Elke. Okay, four. So in these 40 days, in this fasting time, there's at least four days that Jesus would have practiced a Sabbath just in this month alone. Four days that Jesus would have practiced Sabbath and gone to these scriptures and rested and worshiped and stopped and remembered who God was. But this was a practice that Jesus would have been doing for months and years, even before this. So look at what Jesus does. Immediately, Jesus responds. And he says, but he answered, it is written. Now notice Jesus didn't like stop and pull out his, his eye scroll, right? Pull out his digital eye tablet and like look up and say, look right here, Satan. Like they didn't carry around Bibles or Torahs with them. They, no one had the money to be able to have their own personal copy. So when Jesus said it is written, it meant that Jesus had memorized. Now did Jesus memorize this because he was the son of God and he had the Holy Spirit digital download? No, it said, the word of God said that he grew in wisdom. He grew, he memorized just like we would have to do. Jesus had to read, he had to memorize from childhood on. Jesus had to work on this. Jesus memorized this and he said it is written. So with your Old Testament finger, turn over to Deuteronomy chapter eight, like I said, and listen to what Jesus said. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Okay, so back here in Deuteronomy 8, starting in verse 2, let me read this to you. And remember the Sabbath table. Remember that there are elements to the Sabbath table that would cause them to tell stories and to interact and to share as we talk about this. Starting in chapter eight, verse two of Deuteronomy, it says this, and you shall remember the whole way that your Lord, your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what is in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and he fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Why was Jesus quoting this verse? It was so much more than just the bread. Jesus was referring, he was talking to Satan about more than just his, his little tummy is a little hungry here. It was about his identity. It was about God's ultimate provision over Jesus's life. And Jesus was remembering the scripture, the verses that he would feast on every Sabbath and, and pray and remember and dwell and worship every Sabbath and talk about the provision and greatness of God. And Jesus would go back and worship every Sabbath and Remember how great God's provision was in the desert. He allowed his people to hunger so that they could develop a true hunger for God's ultimate provision. 
God allowed them to hunger so he could create, so he could bring manna out of nowhere and feed them so that they could realize that not only would God provide bread for them, but God would provide everything for them. That provision went on just from bread, but you go over to 14, it says, then let your heart be lifted up so that you might not also forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with the fiery serpents and scorpions and the thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you to the water out of the flinty rocks, who fed you in the wilderness with the manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end. Beware lest you say in your heart that by your power and the might of your hand that you have gotten this wealth so that you will remember that the Lord, your God, it is he who gives you power to get you the wealth so that he can confirm his covenant. Where does their strength come from? Their strength comes from the Lord. Where does their provision come from? Their provision comes from the Lord. So in Jesus's valley of the shadow of death, When Satan came to tempt him at his lowest, Jesus was ready to go. Why was he able to live out and make a spring of his valley of shadow of death? Because he was able to operate from rest to rest, from strength to strength, from a day of Sabbath to a life of Sabbath. Because Jesus was dwelling and feasting, remembering these scriptures, In the moment that Satan came tempting, Jesus was ready, prepared to go. And then Satan continued, then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, then throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands, they will bear you up lest they strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. I loved how Jesus was just like, boom, boom, boom. It says, again, Jesus was ready. You ever have one of those moments where you engage in a conversation with someone and then they kind of like start arguing with you and you come back like maybe two days later with the argument that you should have had in that moment? Like maybe you're in the shower, like scrubbing your hair, like I often do. And like in the middle of the shower, you're just like, oh, I could have said this. Or like you're brushing your teeth or mowing the lawn. And that's when the perfect comeback would come to you, right? Like that's how often like I come up with the best comebacks. It's like two days later. But here, Jesus is Johnny on the spot. (laughs) Jesus is ready to go. Why is Jesus ready to go? Because Jesus is operating from strength to strength, from Sabbath to Sabbath, from rest to rest. Immediately when he is tempted, when, when, when Satan is coming and he's saying, all right, is God really with you? That's what this is all about. Satan's like, all right, you've been out here in the wilderness. You're probably wondering, is God really with you? Have you ever felt that before? I don't feel God. I've been wandering around in my desert for 40 days or 40 years. Is God really with me? That's what Satan was tempting Jesus with. Throw yourself from here and then God will prove whether he's really with you or not. He'll send his angels to save you. He'll prove that his presence is really here. How do we know that's what he was really being tested with here, tempted with here? Jesus says, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Old Testament fingers, go back to Deuteronomy chapter six, just a couple of pages over. And in verse 13, this is what we read. It is the Lord your God that you shall fear, him you shall serve and by his name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods for the gods of peoples whom you are around you. For the Lord your God is in your midst. He is a jealous God, lest the anger of your God be kindled against you and he would destroy you from the face of the earth. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Mesa. Another geography term, where's Mesa? Okay, I actually didn't expect you to know that one. I had to look it up. 
Exodus 17. If you turn back to Exodus 17, verse two, you find out where Mesa is. In Exodus 17, verse two, I'll read this one to you. It says this, therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water and the people grumbled against Moses and said, why do you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, what what am I supposed to do with these people, Lord? They're almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel and take with you in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. Behold, I will stand before you in the rock at Horeb and you shall strike the rock and water shall come out of it and the people will drink. And Moses did so. And in the sight of the Israel, and he called the name of the place Mesa and Mirabah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? Is he here or is he not? Have you ever felt like that before? Jesus might've been feeling like that. Satan was tempting Jesus with that. But in that moment of temptation, Jesus's mind immediately went to quote Deuteronomy chapter six, which was quoting Exodus chapter 17. His mind was just like cycling through scriptures, effortlessly recalling scriptures immediately regurgitating them, shoving them in Satan's face to push him away. Again, in his valley of shadow of death, making it a paradise because he's operating from strength to strength. Because so many times before this day, Jesus was operating in rest and worship and in prayer and in scripture memory and diving deep into the treasure of what was available to him. So in his moment of need, it was effortless to respond to Satan. And again, to remind Satan, get off my back. I have a treasure in the depths of God. Your temptation has nothing on that. Provision, presence, all available to my child. And again, the devil took him to another place. Took him to a very high mountain and showed him the kingdoms of the world and the glory. And he said to him, all of this I will give to you if you will just fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, not today, Satan. It's where the hoodies come from, the bumper stickers. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and you shall serve him and him alone. Not only is this a Sabbath day scripture, this this reference, this, this, Scripture that Jesus quotes, if you go back to Deuteronomy chapter six and look at chapter four, Satan here stands before Jesus, takes him to a place and tempts him with all of these kingdoms, tempts him with giving him all of these different places of of the world. And while Jesus was being tempted to take advantage of all these things, Jesus's minds went to the one kingdom that he not only heard every Sabbath day, but where he heard every day what God had provided for him Chapter six, verse four of Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall worship them diligently with your children. You shall worship them in the morning when you rise. You shall worship them when you sit in the house. You shall worship them when you walk along the way and when you lie down at night. You shall worship them by binding them as a sign on your hand. And you shall worship them by binding them on the frontlets between your eyes and you shall write them down and worship them on the doorposts of your house and on the gateways of your homes. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, listen to this kingdom, that he swore to give to Abraham and to Isaac to give you with a great and good cities. 
and that he would not, that you would not build in houses full of good things that you did not fill and cisterns that you did not dig and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full, then take care lest you forget that the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, it is the Lord your God who you shall fear and him you shall serve and him alone. By him you shall swear. This is the kingdom that was fed into the mind of Jesus since he was a child and told to him every single day and every single Sabbath day. Every single one of these elements on the table was told to Jesus, this is the kingdom that God has prepared for you. A kingdom of peace that God has provided you. Cisterns that he has dug. Olive groves that he has planted. Wine groves that he has planted. A table that he has set for you. A kingdom that God has made ready for you. From strength to strength. So when Satan comes and tempts you with some other plan for life, it pales in comparison to the kingdom of God. So when Satan was tempting Jesus, Jesus easily turned to him and said, every day of my life has been filled with worshiping the treasure that runs deep in my life, the treasure that God has given me. Jesus wasn't tempted by any of the things that Satan came to him with because he operated from strength to strength. He operated from a Sabbath day to a Sabbath life. He operated from a day of rest and worship to a life of rest and worship. We have been given a treasure with the Sabbath day. But how many of us are like the old prospector? We are looking somewhere else and we are not digging deep. The story of the old prospector gets a little more bizarre because Henry Comstock is the name by which that load, that silver mine is named after. The biggest silver load that has ever been discovered and started the silver rush of 1859. But Henry Comstock didn't benefit from it at all. He bought that off of his dead friend, discovered that it had silver on it and decided he would turn a quick butt and sold it for a couple hundred bucks. People referred to him as old pancake. He was known to run out of his house wearing no less than seven belts. I don't even know what that means aside from the fact that he'd never have to be hurried to put on another belt. I don't know, he was just a life on the go. He was always trying to make a profit and, and turn a quick buck. He couldn't be bothered to slow down. He was known by that reputation. He died a poor man because he didn't know how to stop, remember, and rest in the reality of what he had. The old prospector died because he was looking in the wrong place. An old pancake died because he didn't know how to find what was right beneath his feet. He didn't know how to stop, remember, and rest. Why is that true for so many of us? We have the treasure of God Almighty beneath our spiritual feet. We've been given the gift of the Sabbath day. Don't waste it. When it comes to spiritual disciplines, let this be your heart. I'm gonna read this as we invite the worship team to come out and, and you're gonna hear Bible reading, scripture memory, prayer, meditation, contemplation, Sabbath day. You're gonna hear all the spiritual disciplines in this Psalm, but it's gonna sound so inviting and relational, you're gonna desire it for yourself. Listen to this. Oh God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. 
So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and your glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich foods. My mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help and in the shadow of your wings, I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you and your right hand upholds me. God, we don't wanna waste another day. Father, you give us a treasure called the Sabbath and we wanna enter into that rest. We wanna find that treasure, not for blessings of wealth and health and prosperity and Jesus, we just want you. God, we just want you. We wanna be restored back into worship. We wanna rest in the fullness of who you are. We wanna find you again and find a day that we can just fall back into your strength and remember who you are and find ourselves working from that instead of falling into the chaos of life. God, we want to use today as a day just to find you so that our lives can be changed by you. How I long to breathe the air of heaven where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets but to look on the one who bled to save me and walk with him for all eternity for there will be a day when all will bow before you there will be a day when death will be no more standing face to face with you
good to worship with you all today. Hi, my name is Matt, and I serve as the Connections Director here at Cascade. If this was your first time joining us, welcome. We're so glad you watched this service today. We're here every Sunday and would love you to plug into our church family in person here in Monroe. If you're not already, we have community groups and ministries for the purpose of creating connection and discipleship. One of the first steps you can take is to fill out the digital connect card in the description of this video. You can introduce yourself, ask any questions you have about Cascade, and even submit prayer requests. Saturday, August 6th is our next big all-church event. We're going to gather at Froning Farm for a day full of fun, games, river baptisms, and a potluck in the grove. This is a fun afternoon for your whole family. There'll be cotton candy, there'll be popcorn, face painting, and more. Uh, meet us at the farm at 12.30 and be prepared for some fun competition. I'll bring a potluck dish to share. If you're interested in being baptized in the river, you can learn more and sign up on the website or our app. SALT is our ministry for young adults, and they meet every Tuesday night at 7 in the Cascade Cafe. Their summer retreat is coming up August 19th through the 21st, and registration is now open. If you want to learn more or register, just check out the website or our app. Thanks again for joining us today. You can continue to be faithful and obedient in the giving of your tithes and offerings by using the website and the app. You can also give in person here at Cascade or by putting a check in the mail. Remember to hit the like button on this video, subscribe to our channel, and share it with a friend. It's an easy way to help more people hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Thanks for being a part of our Cascade family. Have an awesome day, and we'll see you next week.